Uh, well, if you're just joining us, and if you're possibly joining us for the very first time, I just want to say thank you and welcome to Collective Community Church. I'm Pastor Damon. I'm the pastor of Collective Community Church, and we're glad to have you with us. Uh, if you don't know, we haven't been streaming, live stream, at least not publicly, We've been meeting right here in, in, in our sanctuary uh, for, the, for the last few months, I guess even since the beginning of May. Uh, we recently ran into a few problems and had to make some adjustments at the last minute. So I just want to thank you for jumping online with us and, and worshiping with us and getting ready to receive the word of God. There is uh, opportunity for everyone that is watching us online to go ahead and uh, make a little comment. And there's a few buttons you can press just to represent and say, hey, I'm in the house. I'm watching along with you. I encourage you, if you're watching online, to go ahead and hit a button, say hello to everyone. If you got some friends or some other members in the church that's there, not there yet, text them and say, hey, even though we're not in the house of God, we're not physically in the house of God, we can still be in the presence of God. So go ahead, jump online. Let's do this together. That's why we're collective community church because we don't believe that God has called those that are saved, the church of the living God, the body of Christ to be individuals, but he called us to be together. And we, we, when we, when we worship together, we win together. So I encourage you guys to interact with one another, receive the word of God and bless one another as uh, you receive the word through, through our online presentation today. Uh, the Lord was dealing with me about um, a few things and I decided to start a new series uh, may not sound like it's a Christmas series, and not not to say that you got you have to teach a, a Christmas series around Christmas time, but I do want to honor the time and the season that we're in because people are in a certain frame of mind, and while people are in that frame of mind, I would like to capitalize on the frame of mind you're in and remind you of some things that over the course of a year you may have forgotten, but the Lord deposited a series into my heart in which. Jesus fits well into the framework of that, and which he fits well, the Christmas story fits well into the framework of that. And I, the series that I would like to present to you today is Kings and Prophets. How many know that not only Jesus is Lord and Savior, but Jesus is also a king. Although he's not the only king mentioned in the Bible, he's the only one that is king of kings. Come on, the Lord of glory. And so he fits well within there. As I was, as I was thinking through this, and I was thinking through the season that we've been through in 2020, I had to ask myself, Lord, I've seen things in 2020 unlike I've ever seen before. There has been a lot of unprecedented occurrences. Some are positive. I think some of the things that the church has experienced have been positive. I think churches have realized that the era that we're in and the way that people desire to be engaged. And I think we, many churches, some had already made the adjustment, but I think many more church churches have made that adjustment. And now there are some people that have been attending services that hadn't attended services in years because not only are we do we have an opportunity for people to come into the house of God, but for those that may have been through something in church, those that may be a little bit intimidating about walking through the doors of a church, can stream online, watch online, and maybe even watch churches that weren't streaming online before the whole quarantine hit. I think that's positive. I think some of the, the, the things, the ways that families have reconnected and found things to do uh, in ways that we haven't before. I know in my subdivision, I remember during the quarantine, how people in the subdivision was just walking around and we were walking past one another, keeping our social distance. But I had never seen that much neighborly love in that subdivision the whole time I was there. But now all of a sudden people were stopping and talking to one another and, 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 and waving at one another and walking around the lake and, and, and with one another and doing all those things. And I noticed that that was something positive that was coming out of the quarantine. But also this year we've seen upheavals in the political realm, upheavals in the social realm, and some of that had made some positive progress in areas in which America needed to make some progress. But we also know that we also seen people pass away at unprecedented rates 
uh, through this COVID-19. And our prayers are definitely with those people that have contracted that virus that's within this congregation and that they're social distancing. And praise God, if I can give you a praise report, most of them don't even have any symptoms. Some of them have mild symptoms, but all of them, their testimony to me is that they're feeling well and that their God is good. And I said, I already know, but I get in agreement with you that our God is indeed good. So that's been a, a, a positive thing for us. But unfortunately, that hasn't been a case with everyone, I know that just recently we had record numbers where, where people were passing away at record numbers since the beginning of this, this, this quarantine and the beginning of this, this pandemic that we find ourselves in. So I have to ask myself, with all these unprecedented what things, with all these ways that I've seen you ministering to your people, and I've heard Christians speaking differently and, and re being reminded to draw closer to God. God, are you saying something unique during this Christmas season? You ever had someone while in the presence of company and other people, you can tell that they're trying to send you a secret message. Uh, maybe they just start talking funny or start giving you that eye or start looking funny. They're trying to send you a message even though you don't know exactly what that message is, but you know this person well enough to know something about their demeanor is off. Something has transpired. There's something they're trying to communicate to you because things, the way that they're communicating is not as usual. Man, I'm going to tell you, I feel that way about God. And I don't think we can go through this year and see all of these things happen at this one time and not at least inquire of the Lord. Lord, is there some type of message that you're trying to get to me that I have not already received? It seems as if you're giving me a, a funny look. It seems as if you're talking funny. There, it seems as if you want me to draw closer and hear what you really have to say to me. And, and I believe that is the case for this Christmas season. And so the Lord have me title this series, Kings and Prophets. And through this series, not only will I talk about Jesus as king, I'll talk about other kings throughout the Bible, maybe Hezekiah, maybe David. I'll see how much I can fit in. Maybe King Solomon, come on, uh, maybe uh, Ahaz and maybe even Ahab, praise God. <laughs> they talk about the different kings throughout the word of God and the prophets that were in relationship with them and how that impacts our story today. But I thought it was appropriate to start off with the story of the king of kings. Amen. So praise God, if, if we can go to Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1 through 2, and it reads here, and, and, and Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And it says, about the time some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is the newborn king of the Jews. We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. I don't think this story for mo most people online probably is not something that you've never seen before. This is a passage of scripture that's commonly read in the December month of around the holiday season and the Christmas season because it, it talks about the coming of, as you, as, you, as you saw in that scripture, the coming of a king. And one of the things I would like to highlight is notice that they were wise men and they were not three kings as tradition would like us to believe, but these were wise men. And if you would even go further into the language, these were actually magi. And so these, these men had come and it weren't, it wasn't three of them. We don't know exactly what the number was. We know in other references that we know there were three gifts that were given that they brought, but we, we but they did not, that does not necessarily mean that there were three kings. But these, but these wise men, they were looking for someone. Now, around this time, what, what most of us, what we're believing and what we're thinking about is the coming of a savior. Come on, the coming of the Christ. 
But these men did not use that terminology and not say they would have been wrong if they used that terminology, but they used a different terminology in their mind and the vocabulary, the vocabulary that they used, they said, we are you looking for a king? That's important for us to know because yes, indeed, Jesus Christ is the savior. Yes, and Jesus, Jesus is master. Yes, Indeed, he is the Christ, or you can say he is the Messiah, but he is also a king. And in John chapter, chapter 1 and verse 49, we see another person kind of give you the mindset that Israel was in during this period of time. Now, I know for us, the, the word that's probably or the aspect or the title of Jesus that's emphasized most is that of a savior. But Israel, they were looking for something else, and their eyes and their attention was peaked for something else, and they were on alert for something else. And as you go through the Word of God, you'll start to see the, the frame of mind that they were in as opposed to the frame of mind that oftentimes we're in. And it says in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 49, it says, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi or Master, or teacher, another title, he says, you are the son of God. <laughs> Jesus didn't need for him to tell him that, but it was good that Nathaniel was able to pick up on that, but he didn't stop there. He said, you are the king, you are the king, you are the king of Israel. And so if we choose to emphasize Savior during this time, you're, you're, that you're correct. You're not incorrect to say Savior. But, but it's something further that I want to communicate to you today. And for this message, I want to communicate the fact that not only is Jesus Savior, but Jesus is King. These titles mean something. You ever thought to yourself, for those of you, that know a little bit about the word of God. Like, man, how many names does God need? Why does he have so many names? Well, a quick answer to, that, answer to that is he's too great just to have one. But if I would say even further is that every name reveals the aspect of his character, an aspect of who he is and who he desires to be in your life. So I, one of the names that I really like about God that we don't really, we don't really use a lot in churches, but it's definitely in the Bible and it's in the book of Daniel especially, and it refers to God as the Ancient of Days. And, 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 that, and that, that ideal that was communicated is because in the book of Daniel, it was talking about the times the Gentiles would rule in the world, which is a very long span of time that started from the, 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 the visions that Daniel had given, was given, started from the rule in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and went all the way down to the final days on the earth with this mystery kingdom that would rise up. Some say that it's the revived Roman Empire, but it's, it extended beyond the time that we're currently in right now. And what Daniel was communicating with the ideal of ancient of days is this God that we serve, he was here before all these kingdoms ever started, and he'll be here long after they end. He's the ancient of days. There is nothing that has transpired that he's unfamiliar with. There is nothing that he's unacquainted with. Come on. There is nothing that happens that he's unaware of. He is the ancient of days. And I like also in Daniel. Daniel is a book that I, that I enjoy very much. He said also he refers to God continually as the most high God. Now, in, in our times, you know, now it's getting to the place that it's becoming fairly more common for people to say that LeBron James is a better basketball player than Michael Jordan. Now, most people still believe Michael Jordan is number one, but if there was anybody competing for that title, it's LeBron James. But if you were to go back 10 years ago, even while LeBron James was around, even though LeBron James was really good, it was hard to imagine that anybody would be able to dethrone his airness, Michael Jordan. 
Uh, it, was, it was hard to believe that anybody could be a better player than Michael Jordan. For the record, I still don't believe that LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan, but it's the, I will admit, at least it's debatable now. Well, at that time, Nebuchadnezzar's reign was so wide and so influential that most people could not ever imagine Nebuchadnezzar's throne coming to an end. It seemed as if he, there, was no, there was no end to his power. There was nowhere you can go to get rid of Nebuchadnezzar. There was no army that could stand up to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. And so Daniel chose to use the name of the Most High God, understanding I know y'all think that Nebuchadnezzar is high up, but the God that I serve is high above him. There is no one greater. He is the most high. He's not some high. He's not the more high God. He's the most high God. There is none above him. The name meant something. It communicated an ideal. And when we talk about Jesus as king, it frames a different picture than when we say Jesus is savior. And I thank God that Jesus saved my soul and I embrace every identity of who Christ is. I embrace him as Emmanuel. I embrace him as Hosanna. I embrace him as master. I embrace him as savior. But today I want to create a different picture in your mind during this holiday season about the coming of this baby into the earth that we're going to celebrate. And I want to let you know that not only was he a saver, savior in the manger, but that he was the coming of a king that was long awaited. Here we go. I remember a story that I was reminded of as I prepared this message a brother of mine that I, I, I served in ministry with, one souls on the street with, uh, was really close to me. He had an experience and I was there to witness the experience. We were out doing some street evangelism, soul winning, and I was leading the teams. And there was, there was uh, we broke up into two groups and one group was on one side of the street and we were going to go out and share the gospel with people on the streets and just introduce people to the word of God. And for those of you that are here in Birmingham, it's not too often that you come up across people that don't know much about the Bible. But we were in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. And I'm going to tell you, you come up across people all the time that don't eat. Some of them, uh, you, I know this is hard to believe, but I met people who did not know who Jesus was. And I met people who did not know who Adam and Eve was. They know nothing in some cases, not everybody, obviously, but some people know nothing about the gospel. So we went out and shared the plan of salvation, pray for people and for those people that are willing to receive Christ as Lord, we led them to the Lord. And so while we're out, I, all of a sudden I hear screams and, and, I'm, and I believe in leaving te leading teams with order. You know, we don't go out and just do any old thing that we want to do. We're a team. We operate together. We respect businesses. We respect the laws of the land while we're out there. And so while we're out there, I hear screaming coming from the team across the street. And I'm thinking to myself, what is that team over there doing and why are they screaming like that? We don't behave like that. I don't know what's going on. And I look over there and I see Bobby jumping up and down. I see a few other individuals over there jumping up and down and screaming. And so immediately I find a safe place in which I could run across the street and find out what is going on. By the time I get across the street, I see Bobby and another individual uh, another close friend of mine, Kelly, I see them banging on the front of a car hood, banging, standing in front of the car, banging on the hood. And I cannot imagine why they would behave like this. Well, eventually that car came to a full stop and I seen Bobby reach down and grab something and began to pull it out. And it was a man, a car Without looking, a woman had taken prescription drugs and was driving her car and had ran over a man and was dragging him down the street. And right when Bobby pulled him out from up under the car, his head was just getting ready to roll under the tire of the car and Bobby snatched him out. He did whatever he could to snatch him out. 
He put his own life at risk. He stood in front of the car, got that man out and saved him. And all he had was scratches and a few bruises. And the police came and they had to give a report to the police about what happened. And the guy would hug Bobby and smile at Bobby and thank Bobby and all of those things. And the guy was so appreciative that, that Bobby saved his life, saved his natural life. We were out there to save people's spiritual souls. But come on, that day, that guy was going to find out whether he had made Christ his savior or not, if it wasn't for Bobby. But thank God, I don't know what position he's in, but thank God he has more time to make sure that that decision is solidified because Bobby saved his natural life. And you could say it would be totally appropriate to say that Bobby was a savior to that man. In fact, I believe with the gratitude that I've seen out of that individual, that if I went over and said, man, thank God for Bobby, that guy would agree. If I said, man, Bobby saved you, that man would agree. If I said, Bobby was your savior, he may think, oh, okay, that's, that's a little bit, you know, uh, odd choice of words you got there. But he probably would agree that Bobby was a savior. He probably wouldn't have been much pushed back for that. But if I would have said, Bobby is your king, he probably would have been like, okay, well, you know what, I really appreciate that this man, uh, you know, helped me out. And I really appreciate that he, yes, indeed, he did save me. And I'm not willing, even willing to say that maybe today he is my savior, but, but I'm not willing to embrace the ideal that he is my king. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that could be true for some people in the world today, that maybe we will embrace the ideal of Jesus as Savior. Yeah, because a Savior is somebody who just snatches you out of your mess. It gives you the ideal. It's actually a pleasant ideal to have, that, to know that you have somebody that is all-powerful, that is all-knowing, that is watching over you, and they're willing to save you. Obviously, we know that, that, that specifically that's speaking to the Savior from our sins, but we also know that Jesus delivers in other ways. So the ideal of having a Savior is not really much that I have to give up. For a savior, at least not at the hearing of the word, but even at the hearing of the word, without me knowing any Christian doctrine, when you say somebody is my king, it sends a different ideal. And I think a lot of people are comfortable with Jesus being their savior, but maybe not as many people are as comfortable with Jesus being a king. And it says in here in Micah 5, 2, it says, but you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come to you, one whose origins are from a distant past. A prophet spoke these words in advance that a ruler is coming out of Bethlehem. That's how these men knew that the, the, the king had arose because it had been spoken by a prophet. These men didn't just one day look up and see a star and think, oh man, I think that might mean that a king is born. No, these men were hanging on the words of prophecy. These men believed that the things that the ancient of days had spoken what was going to come to pass and when they seen the signs of it they went looking for that king that they were so anxiously waiting for and now he had arose because a prophet had spoken and hence we see this 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 relationship this interdependent relationship established in the bible between prophets and kings we see it elsewhere we see it where young david was getting ready to be anointed. But while God had had his heart on young David, the prophet Samuel was still grieving the fact that Saul couldn't live up to the position the way that he was supposed to. And God had to ask Samuel, how long are you going to mourn? How long are you going to grieve this young man? You know, Saul was much, was, was looked much more like a king at that time, at least, than what David did. And uh, David was not somebody that particularly caught people's attention. 
he, he didn't even catch the attention of those members that were in his house. And even the prophet, a man of God, had, had, had developed a, an infatuation of sorts with this, this, with this king that did not deserve the position of king. Even God had to correct the prophet and said, no, there's a man after my own heart and who I'm sending you to anoint now, and he will be ruler over Israel. And it wasn't in David knew he loved God. David knew that he honored God, and he knew that about himself more than others around him knew it and were aware of it. But the prophet was sent to David, and he confirmed it. The prophet spoke it over David's life and took a period of time before David's life took the turn that it was really supposed to take as king. But not only we see that God anoints and gives grace to kings throughout the Bible, good kings and those that, like he said, like David, a, a man after his own heart. But we see at times where God anoints other kings for specific purposes. And sometimes we don't always agree with it. And matter of fact, sometimes the way that they're going to lead is not necessarily the way that God wants his people to lead, but he'll lead them for a specific purpose. And we see that with Elisha, Elijah, excuse me, Elijah where Elijah was called to anoint two kings, Jehu and Haziel. And it wasn't until the office, the, the ministry of Elisha, in which Haziel was actually anointed. Jehu was the one who, who killed Jezebel. But Haziel took a while, and it was Elisha that went and finalized the anointing as being king of Syria. And when he anointed him, he wept. And Haziel was not the man that he would become. And Haziel asked him, why do you weep? And Elisha let him know, I weep because I know what you're going to do. And so we see that even though God, when he's arranging and when he's an order, he speaks forth a word. And sometimes the arrangements and the orders and the things that are in place are things that man don't agree with. But God puts them in place because there is a relationship between the prophet and king. And God is unfolding a story, whether people like it or whether people don't like it. So the ideal of a king is a ruler. Quite frankly, we can water it down, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. And I know that is a little off-putting to the flesh to a lot of people. And primarily because at best, we've known nothing but imperfect kings or imperfect rulers. And at worst, we've known ones that have been downright wicked. But the truth of the matter is Jesus is a different king. He's not a king of anything that you've ever seen. He's not a ruler like any president like that you've ever seen. He is a perfect and righteous ruler. He rules in authority, and it's important for us to understand that. It's because when we're asking for the king to come, kings just don't come on their own accord. Kings bring something along with them, and they bring authority. Ultimately, what we're believing for, and I want you to set your mind for, is for the authority of God to be made manifest in your life and in the lives of others, because kings bring authority. And who wouldn't want a king that is perfect? a king and that is righteous, to bring forth their authority. When Jesus came, he didn't use his authority to, to tell people to go this way, to tell people to go get his house shoes. Come on, tell people to go, go pick up this, go pick up that. No, Jesus was willing to wash feet, but he also used his authority to com command the blind to see. Come on, he, he also used his authority to cast out spirits out of the maniac of Gadara and other people that were demonically possessed he used his authority to cause the lame of walk, and many were shocked when he had so much authority as king that he was able to command the sea and the winds to be still. You're asking for a king to show up. And I say, well, why you, you say, what did that mean for me? Because some of us have waves that are stirring in our lives. You have winds that are blowing in your life, and it seems like nothing can stop it. But I want to set your expectation and set your faith for God to show up with his authority and with his power and command those things to peace. Be still. You can't tell me after 2020 you don't need peace. You can't tell me for many of the people that, that well, hey, I should, hey man, I should say, you make it. Some of you can't tell me that. But for many of you, I already know. 
that many of you have been robbed of your peace. Now, your peace that the world, the Lord gives us is not contingent to this world. But I, want to know, but I know that even though it's not contingent to this world, some of you have made it and have set your expectation and set your face so that it is contingent to this world. But now we're believing for the king of glory to come in and speak to those areas in which he needs his authority to abide. And we see that what happens when men are in authority, we, we've never had a better example of that probably than this year, at least not in my lifetime. And we had confusion on both sides of the coin. Amen. And I think people are were willing to turn a blind eye to confusion on one side just to get rid of the confusion on the next side. Well, I got news for you. The confusion ain't going nowhere. Men cannot rule themselves. That's why we were given a king, but we rejected that king. And it's important for us to realize that as a church. Maybe the world may never realize that. But as a church, it's time for us to stop turning our attention to one party or to the next party because I'm telling you, none of those parties are going to be able to get you out of the things that are coming upon the earth. But it's only one and one alone who has the authority, who has the reign, who has the delegated authority to give you to go into your life and speak the things and command the winds that are blowing to be peace, to be still, to cause the lame to walk, to cause the blind to see. And that's Christ and Christ alone. We already know him as Savior, talking to believers. And if you don't know him as Savior, you'll have an opportunity at the end of this service. But I find that even though a lot of believers know him as Savior, sometimes I see ones that I know that they have not yet gotten real acquainted with him as king. There's a few realities that I think should sink into the mind of believers during this time. First and foremost is God's prophetic time clock is coming, is winding down really quick. And it's coming to an end. Uh, another one you should you should have sink into your heart. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but if you gave it any level of thought, any level of discernment, you would realize something that the middle ground is beginning to disappear. And I praise God for that. I give God a hand clap because I believe there's going to be some purity in our services once we separate the tares from the wheat, once those that don't really have a heart to follow God just to decide, hey, I ain't even showing up to church, and those that really want God to mold them, I'm not talking about the difference between righteous people per se by their own, by their own works and by their own efforts and unrighteous people. No, I'm just talking about people willing to open up their heart to the king. And that's all the wheat is. The wheat is not in any better position far on their own accord than, than, than the tares. The only thing that make the wheat the wheat is Jesus Christ. And their willingness to say, yes, I need a savior. And yes, I need a king. And I thank the Lord that the middle ground is beginning to disappear. That people, people can't hide what they believe anymore. Either you stand for God or you don't. And I think that's a good place to be in. For the believers that are watching me online, that's not anything for you to fear. Just go ahead and make your decision right now. There comes a time in which you got to stand. Joshua had to make that stand. He said, as for me and my house, I, we stand for the Lord. You know, and God said the same. I mean, Elijah said the same thing to, the, to, to those that followed the prophets of Baal. How long you halt between two opinions? If God be God, to serve him. If Baal be God, then serve him. Well, I'm going to tell you, we already got this established. Jesus is God. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is King. Serve him. No longer a halt between two opinions. And then the next thing is, I want you to realize during this time that should have begun to sink in, is the fact that God is calling us to rise to the occasion. See, the thing is about a ruler is not only does a ruler rule, but a ruler delegates. And when Jesus was lifted up, he delegated a power. He said, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. And it's time for us to go ye therefore. Go ye therefore to, your, to the next family reunion. Come on, go ye therefore to your job. Go ye therefore to your school. Go ye therefore to your community, to your neighborhood. It's time for you to go ye therefore because people need order in a time and the king has come to bring order to the places where there has been nothing, has been nothing but disorder. When I look on my TV, my goodness, I see disorder. 
when I look on the news reports, I see nothing but disorder, not only in the political realm, but in the pharmaceutical realm, in the medical industry, and, and, and come on, amongst schools and things of that nature. We, we, we now, the, the teachers have went to Zoom calls, and the stuff that the kids are picking up on the Zoom call has shown how much disorder and dysfunction our society is in. It seems like it never fails. The minute we have a camera put up, we see that there's nothing but disorder. Cameras are revealing to us ourselves are showing us parts of ourselves that we wanted to hide. And now all of a sudden we see disorder. And if you see that over and over and you don't realize the state that the world is in and you continually trying to cleave to the world to give you order, they cannot give you order because they don't have it themselves. But Jesus does because he's the king. He's the king that God selected from us from the beginning. He's the king in which every single righteous king of the word was modeled after. Jesus and Jesus alone is king. In John 17, verse 18 and 37, Pilate is speaking, and, and I like this, and in Pilate, this is coming to the close of Jesus' days on here on earth in incarnate and bodily form. And it says here, Pilate says, he says, and therefore said to him, are you a king then? And Jesus answered and says, you are right that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. We see Pilate standing before Jesus. And he's cross-examining he's cross Jesus. In this picture, Pilate is along with the crowd that is standing against Jesus. You could even say that he's the prosecutor. And he's been asking Jesus all these questions. And Jesus, there, were time, there was a time in which Jesus wouldn't even respond to Pilate's questions. <laughs> Pilate thought he was in control. And then just the simple way that Jesus was carrying himself, it begins to slowly dawn on him that he's not the one in control, that Jesus is the one in control, even though Pilate is the prosecutor. And the whole time, he wants Jesus to do something. He wants him to deny himself. He wants him to deny his identity. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that that day, along with so many other people that were coming up against Jesus, carrying out the fulfillment of scripture that he would be crucified, they were all demonically used. Some may even be demonically possessed. And I believe that Pontius Pilate, whether he knew it by not, he was being used by the devil in that moment. The devil wanted to use him to end Jesus's life, eat Jesus' life here on earth. And we see Pontius Pilate questioning Jesus, prosecuting Jesus, and he wants him to deny his identity before he leaves. And Jesus says, absolutely not. It's funny because truth was on trial, much like truth is on trial today. And one of the things the enemy wants you to do while truth is on trial, while you're being cross-examined by the enemy, whatever the vessel is, whoever's been used, he wants you to deny your identity. It's like Jesus refused to deny his identity. I encourage you to never, to, to never accept or never embrace the ideal of, 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 of denying your identity. Refuse it. Absolutely. Embrace it. You are who you are. You belong to God. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. You're a child of God. It is what it is. You've died to the world. Dead men can't make new decisions. That is my attitude. There was never, there's no recant in me. Why is no, because I died when I was 24 years old. Dead men can't make new decisions. And your attitude should be the day I said yes to Jesus, I died to this world. There is no recant in me. Hold to the truth. And Jesus made that truth, even though he knew the decision that Pontius Pilate was getting ready to make. And unlike the kings of this day, Jesus came and he said it in his verse. Jesus did not come to, to, to be the judge like many times kings were in that time. But Jesus came to be the star witness. Come on. Jesus came to set the record straight. 
Jesus said it himself. He said, I'm here to bear witness. Other words, I'm here to testify. I'm here to testify. What are you here to testify about, Jesus? The truth? Why? Because lies are trying to reign, but I'm here to set the record straight. I'm a different type of king. I'm willing to get, I'm willing to get my feet muddy. I'm willing to get my hands dirty. I'm willing to jump in and do the testifying if it requires for me to do the testifying. And the reason why I require for him, because the world could not find any credible witnesses. Oh, my goodness. There was nobody worthy to take the stand. Isn't that a ta tactic of today's world? If you have a witness and somebody who's seen something, somebody who experienced something, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm concerned about what they're going to testify, I just want to discredit their witness. Don't you know that is a ploy of the enemy to discredit the witness? They tried to discredit Jesus, but they couldn't. When Daniel, when Daniel was in control and they wanted Daniel out, they tried to discredit Daniel. But just like Jesus, they could find no guile in him. They could find no deceit in him. And I think that now the hour requires, if you want to say back to what I'm talking about in the beginning, and he said, God is saying something. God is what are you speaking. God is saying it's time for you to raise the standard. It's time for my witnesses to be credible witnesses, not perfect witnesses, but witnesses of character. It's time for believers again to raise their standard. I know the world is constantly dropping the standard, but that's okay for us. It's time for us to raise the standard. So much like Jesus was prepared to be a credible witness, so we also prepare to be credible witnesses. I was, I was you know, during a, the, a lot of politicians during this election year were accused of a dog whistling. And, 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 and so if you don't know what dog whistling is, the idea that you're sending coded messages to whoever your audience is. And, and, and you know anything about a dog whistle, in particular, a literal dog whistle, is if you blow a dog whistle, and I, I was so fascinated with this when I was a, 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 a young teen, or I was probably, probably a little bit younger than that, when I was a kid, I was, you, know, you blow a dog whistle, and you can hear a little bit of wind going through, but it blows at such a high pitch that humans can't hear it, but dogs can Dogs can hear the whistle even though humans all around can't hear it. Their ears are tuned to hear that pitch. And I'm going to tell you, maybe those, maybe those politicians, I don't, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care one way or another. My attitude about the world's politics is it's falling. Both sides are falling. And if you cleave on to them, you're going to fall along with them. They're going to fall, and they're going to fall hard. And if you pledge your allegiance to them, you're going to fall along with them. So maybe they are dog whistling. At this point, I've taken every bit of my trust out of any of this world system. I, I've come to the strong reality that there is one person in which my hope lies and one person alone, and that's the Lord God Almighty in heaven. And I, and, I, and I would encourage you to do the same. And so the dog, he said, Jesus, if, 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 if the politicians dog whistle, Jesus just confessed that he dog whistles too. When he dog whistles, the sound that it makes is truth. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm blowing truth. I came to testify of the truth. Now, I understand that some people ain't going to hear it. I think y'all don't hear me today. He said, he understand when I start blowing the whistle of truth, there are going to be some people that don't hear it. My goodness. Don't you know that happened several times? It was once in which God speaks and says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. There was some that they thought it was thunder. And there was, that was one group. They thought it was something natural. They, they, God said it. There was another group. They heard it, but they didn't think it was God. And they thought it was an angelic voice. And it was others that understood and know that it was God because the scripture said that God didn't say it for Jesus' benefit. He said it for theirs. Other words, it was like a dog whistle. It was as loud as crackling thunder, but people could not hear it. And I'm going to tell you, in 2020, God has been speaking to us as loud as crackling thunder. And still, people don't hear it. 
people still think it's nothing to be concerned about. People still thinking I got plenty of more time. People, people still thinking that I can just go ahead and continue to waddle in whatever I've been waddling. I'm telling you, soldiers of God, it's time for you to stand up straight. I'm telling you, pure virgins, wise virgins, it's time for you to trim your lamps. It's time for you to understand that the king is coming. And he has a whistle of blowing of truth. And the people of truth are not people that are just so righteous. People that are just so accepting of truth. People are just in love with truth. No, it's just people willing to let go of the lies. They'll hear it. Much like those dogs only hear that whistle. And those that don't hear it is because they don't want Jesus as their king. Their attitude is just the, at the same attitude as those people that were there when they finally decided to crucify Jesus and Pontius Pilate gave them one more opportunity. Who are you going to choose, Jesus or Barabbas? No, no, we don't want him. We don't want the king of the Jews. We want Barabbas. Don't be the person that chooses Barabbas in the last hour. My Lord, my Lord, what is it like to not know because you what because you weren't willing to listen in your heart? You did not want Jesus as King. You were willing to embrace Him as Savior, but the minute He said, "I want to rule and I want to reign in your life," you said, "No, I don't want that." I'm gonna tell you, people, allow God in. Allow him to reign. Allow him to rule in your life. Jesus, during this Christmas season, oh, praise God. Jesus, during this Christmas season, wants his people to open their heart to receive him as king. We see when we receive him as king, how that impacts our life, how that impacts our life. Our, our, our walk in Christ Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, it reads here, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, oh my goodness, he likes this ideal of him being a witness, huh? He's testifying once again. He said, I'm a faithful witness. You, you never once went and fact-checked me and found out what I said was inaccurate. He said, I'm a faithful witness. And he says that I'm the firstborn from the dead. Notice what it says, firstborn from the dead. I say that because there's some false theology about being Jesus being created with that passage of scripture. Notice it says, firstborn from the dead. It's speaking to this, he, him, him resurrecting after his incarnate ministry on the earth. So no, Jesus was not born in heaven. He is God. And it says here, God is one, right? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it says, and the ruler, oh, once again, we see this title given to Jesus. I think by now it should be established in your mind that Jesus wants to be a ruler in your life. And he is definitely a ruler in this earth. But you have the right, you have the right to accept him as ruler of your life. But at one day, you're going to have to come to terms with the decision that you made. He is the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sin in his blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Man, if you want to get a little pushback, you start reading verses like this, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that, yes, there's many churches in America, but churches have their traditions. Uh, denominations have their traditions, and there are certain denominations, certain teachers, certain bishops that are very strong in certain areas and are good at keeping the people that follow them focused in certain areas, and so people get trained up one way, and they get to the place where there's somewhat of a uh, a preposition that is made, that, 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 that is assumption that is made in certain areas of the Bible where people just won't, won't, will, will have already have their mindset where they can't receive new truths, even though it's right there in Scripture. And we see the pushback here because not only did Jesus say, say that, 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 that he is a king, he saw Pontius Pilate, yeah, you said I'm a king, I am a king. You're right, Pontius Pilate. Hey, Nathaniel, guess what? You called me a king. Guess what? 
you're right, I am a king. But Jesus said, I'm the king of kings. Well, I'm telling you, I got to believe that those people that are prime ministers, that are presidents and kings, they're not the kings that Jesus was talking about just because they're in the world. The king of kings, he explains right here in his scripture. Who is the kings? Who are the other kings? You are. The believer is. The person that has said yes to Jesus, the person that knows, has the inward witness of the spirit that I am born again, the person that knows without a shadow of doubt, I am a part of the, of the church of the living God, the, the, the person that knows in their heart and has that inward witness and know that I am a part of the body of Christ because I have given my life to the Lord and I have received him as a savior of my life. And as a disciple, I've chosen to follow him. Who, who are the kings? We are. Those are the kings. And so I noticed that people out of false humility, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm, king, I'm, a, I'm a servant. And just like we said, the two things to be true, Jesus is savior and Jesus is also king. You can be servant and you can also be king because I think people don't understand the way that when Jesus say you are king, you are not first to think of the kings of this world, but think of the example that he set as king. And if you don't receive that, then that's not humility. Humility is not telling Jesus that something he said about you is wrong. That's not humility. That's actually the exact opposite. If God said something about you and you tell God that he's wrong and that this is really true, that you're no longer operating in humility. You're operating in pride. You just told God that him and his word is wrong. I don't know. I think you're taking that a little bit far, Pastor. Am I really? Because there was a story of a guy named Peter, if you know that guy. And Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be taken away. I'm going to die for you. And, 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 and Peter in Matthew 16, 23, he says, he turned to him. He said, he said he, Peter said, no, no, you, you won't. He pulled him to the side and said, no, I'm not going to allow it. I won't let that happen. And this is what Jesus' response was, him, was to him. And Jesus turned to him and said, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you are an offense unto me. But this is the part that I want to draw your attention to today. Not only the fact that he called him Satan, but he said, you're an offense unto me. You're mindful. You're, you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And I find that people that are willing to not accept this ideal, they may seem, seem very humble and seem like, their, their heart is really to please God, much like Peter did. Seemed like it was a very noble thing for Peter to go and tell Jesus, hey, I love you so much, I'm not going to allow you to do that. But Jesus did not see it that way. Jesus saw it as demonic because it was holding back something that was necessary. And I'm going to tell you something. Is the church, it's necessary for the church not only to see Jesus as Savior and see their need to be saved, but it's time for you to understand that you have royal identity. It's necessary because when you know you're royal, you begin to act like you're royal. You begin to think like you're royal. You begin to expect like you're royal. Oh, stop, 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 stop what you're thinking. I'm not talking about the king, the, ro the royalty and the kings of this world. I'm not talking about being pomp and having your head in the air and, and, and commanding other people to do your bidding. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about the kingship in which Jesus has identified because the kingship that Jesus identified was something different than the world had ever seen before because Jesus did not only say you were a king, he gave you another hint. He said, we are kings and priests. And that speaks to an individual of the Bible called Melchizedek in which before him there was no king and no priest. And he was a mystery figure of the Old Testament. And it said that in, a, in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is a king after order of Melchizedek, and we are also kings and priests after the order of Jesus. Other words, we're of a new order. We're a new breed. When we say kings, if you know kings in the world, you don't know us. You ask anyone. You believe that we're a royal priesthood based upon 1 Peter 2 and 9? Yeah, 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 I believe that. 
Yeah. Well, you do you believe in 2 Timothy 2.12 that it says that if we endure, we'll reign with him? Yeah, yeah, I believe that. Well, it says we're royal priesthood. It says that we'll reign with him. Why can't you receive that in Revelations 1.6? It says that we are kings and priests. And I'm telling you, it's time for you to raise your identity, change the way you see yourself and understand that not only was Jesus a king and during his time, should, we should emphasize that, but Jesus was also a king and you are also in his image, created after a new order, a king and a priest. And I like this. And I think part of the reason that we think that way is because we read a lot of the Pauline epistles and Paul starts off just about every epistle as he's a servant, he's an apostle servant. And I think that was a great identity. I think believers need to know that God has called you to be served. Believers need to know that God has called three, three S's. God has called you to be sons. God has called you to be servants. God has called you to be soldiers. Every believer needs to know that. But man, this was written, this was a revelation given to John. And if you don't know, John, John, John was a little bit different. Come on. John got revelations that the other apostles didn't. That dude was just different. And it's good for you to know that because John was of the, all the apostles, John was the one that died of old age. <laughs> yeah, when, it's, it, it doesn't surprise me that oftentimes, especially if you're talking to a seasoned minister and, and someone asks, what is the first book of the Bible that I should read? Most times I would, I, would, I would even guess that more times than any other book, the book of St. John is the one that is, that is, that is referred here we have these, these revelations of John. We have in, in, the, in the Gospels, you have the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. They're all pretty much the same. A little bit of variance here and there, but John comes from a totally different angle. And here we have, this is the one too that, that, that <laughs> this is the one too that, that John is the individual that Jesus chose to give responsibility of his mother to. And for those of you that believe that Jesus Christ was a black man, amen, <laughs> then, then you know how black men feel about their mother. <laughs> they just, they're not going to just give their mother over to, to anybody, amen. <laughs> so Jesus, so we know that John must have been something very special about John. He's the one that was in Jesus' bosom. I like how John, throughout the book of John, he said the one who Jesus loved. Who is the one who Jesus loved? John? Me. I'm the one that Jesus loved. John was solidified in a revelation that he had, and he walked boldly in it. And John was the one bold enough to say, oh, yes, God has created us to be servants. Oh, yes, God has called us sons. Oh, yes, but he has also called us to be kings. Yeah, this new revelation that John gave for. And I think it's important that we embrace those two identities. One, and embracing the identity of king, it speaks to rulership. Yes. You need to know that God not only wants you to rule and reign, not meaning that you should go into the political realm. Not, that's not, at least that's not a scripture directing you in that direction. Maybe for some believers, God is calling you to go to political realm, but that's not a scripture telling all believers to go into political realm and try to rule this world or any of those things like that. No, 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 no. That's not what God. But first and foremost, God has called you to rule, rule in your life. What, what is a king that can rule? What is a king that tries to rule other places, but he can't rule himself? And some of us, we have not ruled and reigned over sin the way that God has called you to rule and reign over sin. You say, well, I don't know if we should rule over sin. But then you need to reference Romans 6. And it says, don't let sin, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Why? Because it robs you of your identity as a king. Rule and reign over devils. Well, I don't know whether we should rule and reign over devils. But then tell that to Peter when he spoke to the lame man at Gate Beautiful. That he didn't pray for him. He just simply told him, rise and walk in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you that God has caused you to rule and reign over demonic forces. As a king. This is a spiritual reign. And I would think you should be willing to embrace that. 
Because a lot of times when we read this, some believers have taken this as their ammunition that they're supposed to rule and reign in all of these natural realms. And yes, you can increase your influence. And God wants you to increase your influence amongst people. He wants you to let your light shine so that men may give glory unto him. So whatever sphere that God has called you to, whatever area that God has called you to rule and reign, let your light shine. But this is not a call for you to try to rule in the natural world. They wanted Jesus to rule in the natural your world. But he said, man, that's beneath me. No, literally, it's beneath me. It's an old earthly reign, and God had called me to a heavenly reign. And the same thing for you, ruling and reigning in this natural world that's soon going to fade away is beneath you. God has called you with a holy and a heavenly calling. But he wants you to walk into your identity. Step into your identity operate in authority over this world. What's the authority we brought? That you refuse to shut up the gospel of Jesus Christ. You refuse to shut your mouth about the kingdom of God. That's the authority that you're walking in. There were times in which Jesus spoke and one, one centurion and one soldier turned to another man that he would, and to give account to him. He said, why didn't you arrest him? He said, because never have I heard man speak like that. He was using an authority in the world, and that was not an isolated incident because eventually the same thing happened to the disciples, and they looked at him and could see that they had been with Jesus. It's time for God to look at you and see that you've been with Jesus. There's a royalty on that person that I cannot deny. There's a royalty on God's church that I cannot ignore. It's important for believers to rise up during this time as we move into 2021. There's more things that's going to happen. I guarantee you the things that we're seeing, they're not going back to the way, the way that they were. How do you know that? Because the Lord already told us about it. And he said it's only going to progressively get worse. What has it done since the 2020s? I remember there was a time you couldn't, you couldn't, you, you would have you'd been hard pressed to tell somebody about a mass shooting. Until Columbine happened, and we were blown away by that. How many mass shootings have happened since then? How more frequent have they become? What do you need to know during this time? It's not going to get better. So set your attitude to rule and reign in the believer. Go ahead and be comfortable with the middle ground disappearing. Choose your side today and choose to walk in your authority and walk in your rule and your reign as a king. The world's heritage, this kingdom is beneath you. And then if I can give you something else, it said that we are also not king. We are also kings. It says we're also priests. What does that speak to? A sanctification. God has called you to rule and reign, but again, not rule and reign in the way to the world. We rule and reign through our service. We rule and reign through our obedience. We rule and reign through our love. This is how believers rule and reign. We rule and reign through our testimony. And then we also preach we are sanctified. Can you be perfectly pure, sanctified only by the blood? But you can also live uprightly before God. That's what righteousness is. It's right standing with God. It's not perfectness before God. It's right standing for God. I'm striving to pursue you. I'm striving to look like you. I'm striving to act like you. And I'm receiving your grace to do it better and better every day. The, the, the priests were, were not without sin, but they were with standard. And God is causing his people to be kings and priests. Step in your authority. Step in your authority in your own life. Use it against your personal flesh. Step in your authority in the realm that is around you, in your family, in your job, in the different areas of influence in your neighborhood. Start casting the spirits and the demonic forces and start being a, a beacon of hope for your community and those people that are around you. Step in that authority in the world. Come on and speak to those demonic entities that want to influence and be the king that God has called you to be. And obviously when I say king, I mean in de and indeed queens as well. And then be priest. Be sanctified. I believe that during this hour, that more so than ever before, uh, or at least in recent years, God is calling his people to sanctification, to walk in this identity.
So as we as our, as our minister today, we'll find that not only do we do these things and we see the results in other people's lives, but now you begin to see what you look like and the things that you can do when you embrace what God has called you to. So I thank you guys for receiving this message today. And I pray that if you're online right now, I just want to pray for you where you're at. So I'm going to give you an invitation after I pray. So Father God, I just want to thank you for life and life abundantly, that you are the giver of life. You said you came to testify of the truth. But I know that not only did you come to testify the truth, that you came also that we may have life and have it more abundantly. is another reason you've stated that you've come. So I pray for every person that's online, those people that, that, that said, I know I need to step in my identity. I need to be who God has called me to be. I need to walk in the authority, walk in the rule and reign as Christ has already exemplified for me. I need to allow the rule and reign of Christ in my life, and I want to follow him. So maybe you've never made that decision ever before. You've never made the decision to follow him. I'm asking you to do it today. I'm saying, why don't you join your faith with my faith? Why don't you go ahead and, and, and apply that faith to believing in Jesus Christ as Savior right now? I want to lead you through that. And I know some of you, you just need to turn to God. You just need to repent. So I want you to go ahead and do that today. I want you to turn back to God. Maybe you've turned away for multiple different reasons. People do that. Uh, you've been, maybe some things have been going on in your life, and you've been choosing the world over choosing Christ, and it's time for you to repent. It's time for you to receive God's forgiveness, and he willingly forgives. He said, if you, if you will confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I'm believing that that's going to happen today as you, as you pray, that you want to confess your sins. Speak it out. Say, Lord, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. Lord, I'm making a decision to turn away, to repent means to make a 180 degree turn. You're changing your mind about the path that you were on and you're choosing to go down the other path. I'm going to pray for both parties. I'm going to pray for those of you that want to, that want to uh, be saved and pray for you that, that those of you that want to repent. Let's pray for those that want to be saved. I want everybody to pray. Just go ahead and join your faith. You can comment online. This is support them. Praise God. And say, Father God, I do believe that Jesus Christ died for me on the cross at Calvary. I believe he carried my sins for me and he is risen. Right now, Jesus, I receive you as a savior of my life. I repent of sin. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are Lord, Savior, and Master. And I believe